to bless our uh, service here together, and then we'll begin. <clears throat> If you're able, if you'd stand, we're just going to sing verses 1 and 4 of number 650, Go Ye Into All the World, and then immediately after we'll show the Malta video, verses 1 and 4 of number 650, Go Ye Into All the World. <laughs>
appreciate the 
uh, effort that's been made to make everything possible today by those here and those who've traveled. I appreciate your flexibility. Uh, where we are and the type of ministry that we are in and with the kids in school, uh, it's likely that we'll be doing shorter furloughs like this in summer months, not every year, but every two to three years, something like that. And when you have 39 supporting churches and then a number of individuals, thankfully a lot of those individuals are in those supporting churches, uh, it makes it difficult even geographically to get to all of them. And I know we've been in uh, at Calvary Baptist not a long time ago, and the same with Bethel, it seems like a while ago, but we'd been, uh, we hadn't been to some of our supporting churches since 2010. And so this summer, that was our priority, is to get to these churches that have been supporting us for a long time, but we just haven't been able to be there. And that meant, in order to maximize our time, if we could get a few churches together in one place on a Sunday afternoon, uh, then it would allow an update to happen, even though we can't get to your uh, place of, of meeting. So I thank you, people from Fredericton and Minto, for coming today to join us here in St. John. Uh, as really, we glorify the Lord together with what's happening in Malta. Uh, after the service, some of us will be at the table that's in the foyer out here, and we want to be able to greet you personally. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity to say hi to everyone yet, so we'll be there. And you can take a prayer card if you have uh, lost yours a long time ago. You can take a new one and uh, sign up for our prayer letter if maybe your email address has changed along the way and you no longer get our updates and you want to, you can do that. But thank you for coming. Thank you to our uh, sound guys in the back for their great hospitality because I spent a lot of time in there with them this morning trying to sort out some technological things. Uh, thank you to our family who in the last... Uh, 10 years has hosted us a lot through our journey, and we really appreciate uh, that level of, of really fellowship for the gospel. It's family connection for sure, but it's more than that, and we appreciate uh, all that everyone has done for us. Thank you for the birthday cards. Uh, just little text messages mean a lot, and when we receive those from you, uh, it's just great to know. Uh, because the reality is, is we're weak people, and I have faced more different kinds of situations in the last couple of years, ministry-wise, than uh, different things I've never faced before. And we can truly say, not just in song, but personally, yet not I, but through Christ in me. That's the only way we can do it. And I was telling Pastor Boss Friday evening that every, every service at our church in Malta, anything can happen. Any kind of person can walk through the door, any kind of situation can present itself that we always have to be on our toes, so to speak, prayed up, read up, ready to go, uh, ready to just lean into the Lord's strength for things that uh, I've never encountered before. So uh, that song really is our testimony, and we're grateful that the Lord is always with us. And I want to be able to share some of that with you here this morning and to remind you of what it is we're doing, where it is that we're at, and to simplify it, Matthew 28 tells us in the, that version of the Great Commission, uh, according to Matthew, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, uh, teaching them to observe everything that Christ has commanded, and he's with us. And that's really what we're trying to do, and that uh, teaching, making disciples, baptizing people, uh, teaching them what it is Christ has said and then how to do that uh, consistently in their lives is the framework of what we do. And that looks different every day. It takes all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Uh, but that's what we're trying to do in the country that God has called us to. And uh, the ministry we were previous, previously in, uh, there's a lot happening there too. I was just there in May. And uh, we have ongoing relationship. And I won't uh, share specifics about that today because of our live stream, but uh, there's a lot happening there, and we're grateful. Uh, the pastor and his family are doing very well, and we will have some teachers going there in the spring next year to teach a class, and uh, we're praising the Lord for what's happening there. So we're in Malta, uh, but we still have that link to the other ministry, and we continue on with that and are thankful for that opportunity. But just to remind you a little bit about where Malta is on the map 
Uh, well, let me just begin with our family. And uh, you just saw us all, but just to update you, Rowan is 13 now, and uh, he's been in middle school in Malta now for two years. And this year, as we get back, Kian will begin at that same school because he's now 11, going into uh, year seven, which is the equivalent of grade six here in Canada. And so that'll be a big adjustment for him. Thankfully, his older brother has paved the way a little bit, and that will help him adjust. But, but uh, pray for them as they are in that school. Uh, the schools where our kids go are their Maltese go, uh, public schools. And much the same as here, there's some different elements uh, in it. Uh, but there's about 30% of the kids are, are foreigners in the school. So our kids don't stand out as being too different. Uh, there's not a lot of North Americans, but there are people from all over the world that are their classmates from uh, Libya and Japan and Sweden and uh, Korea and all kinds of places. So it's a very international place and that reflects in their schooling. So the boys are 13 and 11 in middle school. Sela and Naya are nine and six and they're still at the primary school that's near our house as well and uh, continually, continually growing. Paul was in Malta in the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. He didn't plan to go there, but as they left Crete toward the end of the sailing season, they encountered that uh, big storm that carried them for a couple of weeks across the sea. They didn't know where they were. Uh, they all thought they were going to drown, and an angel appeared to Paul one night telling him that no one would and that they must be shipwrecked on some island. And that's exactly what happened. And they uh, landed there in Malta on a winter's uh, day in the rain. And those storms still happen, not maybe to that extent as that one, but there are regular storms and the locals can uh, identify usually within a week or two on kind of when the storm is going to come because they're fairly regular. And we've seen uh, when my parents were visiting us a couple of years ago in February, right around the Feast of St. Paul's shipwreck, uh, there was one of these big storms and a, a small tanker that was moored offshore came off its moorings in the night uh, in the storm and came right onto the rocks and the, the sailors just walked off onto the dry land. And so uh, that happened the same day as supposedly Paul's shipwreck happened many years later. So it was just a, uh, evidence of what happens and that's how the Apostle Paul came to be there, was there for three months and then we don't hear about Malta after that in biblical history, but probably there were some believers left behind. Now you can see where it is on the map. Just, uh, it's about a hundred and, I, I measured it last night, about 190 kilometers from Sicily. So uh, if you look at the map from Lepro to Moncton, that's kind of the distance away that we are from uh, Sicily. We're not that far. And then we're about 380 kilometers north of Tripoli in Libya and uh, due east to Tunis, Tunisia. So the distance that uh, we would have between here and Truro, uh, approximately something like that away from North Africa. So we're not that far away from there either. And in the spring, uh, we'll have some days that look a little bit like it did here this morning, except it's not fog in the air, it's Saharan sand. And we get this cloud that comes in, and then when it rains, it's all like mud, and everything's just a mess to be able to, to clean up. So we're not that far away from the desert uh, either where we are. Two main islands make up the country, and uh, Gozo is the one just to the top of that. And you saw in the video that we have a Bible study there in the midweek, and I'll mention more about that in a moment. But altogether, we're about 316 or 360 square kilometers, something like that. And if you look at the, if you can notice the dimensions of that key at the bottom of the map, you'll, you'll see that we're not much more than 10 kilometers wide on the main island and about 40 kilometers long. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what it's like when you're living there, that seems like a small space, and it is. But we don't have highways, and 60 kilometers an hour is as fast as you travel most of the time, except a few little places you can drive 80. So to go from one end of the main island to the other takes you about an hour. And uh, this just gives you a sense of the, the size, just a different type of a place, uh, very hilly and a, a lot of cars and a lot of traffic and so on. 
But that's where we are, tucked into the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and just uh, below, or in Europe, but just below the mainland and just above Africa. This is St. Paul's Bay, where traditionally the shipwreck took place. And on that island, there's a monument to the shipwreck. You can go, we, I haven't been out there, but some people in our church have been. And they say there's a, a scripture verse out there on just a simple verse on a plaque out where that monument is. And it very well could be the place where Paul was shipwrecked. This is the same bay, just looking from another uh, side. And you just try to picture all those buildings not there and all those boats not there and a bunch of 276 people trying to make it for shore in the rain and, and the winds and the waves. And that's, that's where it took place, likely right there at St. Paul's Bay. Uh, but it's just a, a hunk of rock in the middle of the sea. Uh, it's all limestone, and as you look at the buildings, and you'll see photos of the building project at the church in a few moments, and it's just all, all brick and rock, and just a rugged coastline, big cliffs in some places, uh, that you can go to, and it's just uh, incredible to picnic alongside of them. And uh, if you drop an olive, it might roll over the edge. Uh, one of these cliffs, and this, you can safety is not as much of a concern there as it is here. So there's not fences everywhere like we have in a, a lot of places where we're used to here. Uh, some of you have Mediterranean sea salt on your kitchen table, and some of it comes from places like this. This is some of the natural salt pans where they pump in the seawater next to it and just let it evaporate and then scrape out the salt. There's some more uh, technologically advanced ones in Malta as well. But you see those, some of these have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years to gather the salt out of the ocean. In fact, the tap water we have in Malta all comes from the ocean as well. It just comes through a desalination plant first because we don't have any fresh water. There's no rivers or lakes or ponds. Uh, so we just depend on what the rain brings and what is pumped out of the ocean, and thankfully uh, that gives us what we need for the most part. Uh, but it's a, it's a fun place to be able to explore uh, across the countryside. It's beautiful, it's rugged in the summer, it doesn't rain for a couple of months, and the soil on top of that limestone isn't very thick, so as soon as the rain stops, everything just gets crispy and brown, and then when the rain starts again in the winter, things green up. But we don't have big trees, uh, like you see here in the picture, olive trees and some scrubby pine is really what's there for the vegetation. Uh, a lot of uh, just grass and flowers, a lot of caves uh, that can be explored, and some of them are, are very old. This was along an old Roman road that uh, a lot of people find old Roman coins along this road. We, we looked, but we didn't find any. Uh, but this, uh, just a beautiful land. I haven't been to Israel, some of you have, and some people have said that Malta reminds them of some of the landscape in Israel, just the arid climate and, and the ruggedness of the land and the limestone and so on. Uh, this is in Gozo, in the uh, middle of the capital city. There's an old, big fortress that you can go in, and it's the same way if at Emdina, in the middle of the main island, there's a, a huge fortress city that you can still go in. People live in these cities. And it's just a, a testament to the history of the country. Being right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, it was a very strategic place that whoever controlled that island controlled all the shipping routes of the Mediterranean. And so those who had it defended it uh, well, and, uh, but not good enough because there's been many people who've controlled it along, along the way, and there's a lot of history from different periods that are uh, there along the way. But you can see just ancient things. There's about a dozen temples like this in the country that date to two to 3,000 years B.C. So when you read through some of the uh, ancient religions of the Old Testament, which would have been the same time as this, uh, you, can, you can go in there and you can see these stone temples and the altars and the pillars and where they would uh, worship the celestial bodies and there's kind of holes in the wall where at the summer solstice the, the sunlight comes directly into this inner sanctum in the temple. And they're so old that historians really just guess as to what the practices were. And they've recovered some little idols and various things that are in museums. But there's just a lot of history there from many different eras. Uh, the British had Malta for 200 years or so. 
And there's a lot of British history, and so this is at one of the uh, forts where you could shoot muskets and see the swords. And there's a lot of Second World War history that's there as well. There's all that beautiful landscape that you saw a little bit of, but a lot of it's just very congested towns and cities. This is Musta in the middle of the island. Uh, there's a famous church there in the middle that's the third largest dome in Europe. And an uh, amazing story happened in the Second World War where uh, a German bomb came through the roof of the church during a mass. There was a few hundred people inside, but it did, the bomb didn't explode. It just hit the floor and rolled across, and they call it the Musta Miracle. And you can still uh, go in, and you can just see where it was that it had come through the roof. Uh, this is the same uh, place from the sky, but you can just see uh, the congestion, and that this one town kind of joins the other as you go along. Uh, this is uh, a street in the capital city of Valletta, and I asked people, can you find a parking spot on that street? And uh, one of the great challenges of just everyday life is finding somewhere to park. And it's a, a busy, congested place with 30-something new cars coming onto the island every day. And uh, it's just uh, real, a real problem. And with the, all the construction that's happening, a lot of these streets have building cranes and cement trucks in them, which really slows things down. Well, you can just see uh, some of the streets. They're, they're fun to walk on when we're doing our Saturday morning outreach because you just get to see all these little alleys and nooks and crannies and the places that people live. But it's just quite solid. And uh, Pastor Bard and Lynn can testify to that because they'd walk through this on their way to the church from where it was they were staying. And that's just what it's like uh, everywhere. This is our family walking along a street. One of the unique things about Malta is that almost all the houses have a house name. And so it's interesting as you're going along to see all the, the house names. Many of them are religious names. Many of them reflect where the people are from because uh, many emigrated after the Second World War to Australia and to Canada and some have come back. So you see you know, Maple Leaf and Canada House and Boomerang and uh, Australian names. Uh, Erica found one with her name on it along the way uh, one day. And you can see in our hand uh, some white envelopes. Uh, one of our means of outreach there is we have these envelopes with four or five pieces of gospel literature uh, in English and Maltese. We have two official languages. Almost everyone speaks English. Uh, but we have this literature, and we can put it in mailboxes uh, freely and talk with people we meet on the street along the way. So we do that with a handful of people on Saturday mornings. And uh, this was one of those times, this is just before we moved there actually, but we found, uh, we found an Erica house along their way. Our house is called uh, Ola, is the name of our house, and it's right near here. This is from our roof looking down, and we have the blessing of having a bit of a courtyard in front of our house. Uh, you can see there perhaps all of the doors is kind of like row houses, and our house is just out of the picture to the right, uh, but there's over a dozen kids that live right in where we do. So our kids have friends that are knocking on the door all the time, and we are getting to know our neighbors. We were so glad that when we had to move, uh, the place opened up two doors down, and we didn't even have to leave that uh, complex. And uh, relationships are so important wherever you are as you're getting to know people and share the gospel. Uh, all of our Kids' friends go to Mass every week, so they're all Catholic families. Most of them. There's a, a Chinese uh, family as well that's there. Uh, but this is where we spend a lot of our time, just right here, at least the kids. Uh, but they're involved in the community. The girls were in gymnastics, and the boys played uh, basketball. This is the front of the boys' school, their school grounds, and uh, uh, quite a view that they have from their school there. Uh, but they played basketball there. Uh, Rowan's quite interested in aviation, and he was able to take a uh, flight course last summer and was able to go up for a flight. So there's a lot of things to be involved in there in the country, and uh, in the midst of the busy ministry schedule, we try to be involved, and it's a great way to get to know people. Uh, at the schools there, uh, a lot of the kids don't take the bus. They just are brought by their parents and picked up by their parents. And the way that that works is you have a school of 600 kids 
And when it's time for school to be finished, you have a couple hundred parents crammed up at the doors waiting to get their kids as they come out. So it's, it's a, bit, a bit of a chaos every day, but it means that you see, see the same people every day, morning and evening usually. And then when your kids are in the same sports as some of those people and in girl guides or whatever else, uh, you, and uh, birthday parties are big, so you get invited to McDonald's birthday parties uh, throughout the year, and you're just seeing the same people all the time, and uh, those friendships begin to form naturally in those contexts, and people uh, find out that you're Christian but not Catholic. What does that mean? And it opens up conversations uh, to be able to be had. Uh, the religion is Catholicism, and the major feature in most of the towns is the uh, village church. And even in places that look like just a little town, uh, there'll be a huge church. This is a church that uh, the Pope has visited on different occasions. And uh, it's quite uh, a sacred place. And uh, Catholics, uh, they go there. And supposedly they, there's healings that have taken place there. Here's a, a village where our teammates, Joe and Jenny, live. And again, you can see the, the church at the top of the hill that dominates uh, the view of it. In fact, there's some hotels on the edge of the hill that want to expand a few stories higher, but they're not letting them because it would get in the way of people seeing the church when you uh, come into the town, and they want the church to be the most prominent thing. Uh, this is the same church as was in the first picture, just from the front. And as you saw in the video, there's over 300 and 50 of these churches, uh, more than one per square kilometer, it works out. So there's just, you go down the main street in Valletta, and there's this church on either side of the road the whole way down, and mass is going on daily, the people are there, uh, and the uh, patron saints of each village, and all the feasts and fireworks and drinking parties in the streets that are all part of that uh, worship, I suppose, and celebration that go along uh, with these things, uh, you just you see all of the time uh, there. So it's very much a part of people's lives and their culture. And even though a lot of people are becoming more secular and leaving some of that behind, that's kind of what they fall back onto as a safety net in their, in their lives at the end of their life. And they uh, are not comfortable leaving that for some other religious alternative. Many don't know what other alternative there may be. And uh, so we, we have a lot of conversations with people who are on that journey. Joe and Jenny Mifsud are our teammates right now, and uh, they started the church back in the 1980s. And uh, Joe's dad is Maltese, so they have a, a firm connection to the country. Yeah, they've just been faithful servants of the Lord for many years. And uh, the second stint that they've been back has been uh, 12 years now. And in that 12 years, they didn't have any helpers. Uh, they came back to the church after it had had uh, problems and things had dwindled and there was just a lot of things to clean up. And they've done a great job, but they had been praying for years for people to join them and nothing ever materialized. There were people that looked, but nothing really connected or materialized. And when we were changing from Turkey to Malta, uh, it just was a really good fit and it was an answer to their prayers, and they're just a joy to work with. They're like on-the-field grandparents to our kids, and uh, we just have a great working relationship. We're, we're different. We come at things differently. We're different ages. Uh, the time of our week, other than the service time, is spent very differently than they do, but uh, it just fits together very, uh, very well. And we, we love Joe and Jenny, and they're keeping our cat alive while we're away here in Malta as they stop in every few days to feed him. And there's been a few uh, adventures along the way that we've heard about with neighboring cats and open windows and those types of things. So um, we think he'll still be there when we get back. But we're thankful for Joe and Jenny's commitment, not just to the ministry in Malta, but to our family and uh, trying to keep us together with our pets as well. And we, we love them, and they mean, they mean a lot to us. Uh, they started the church and were able to see this building built in the 1990s, which was an amazing thing, because until that time, and let me just back up, when they went to Malta in the early 1980s, the only other congregation that was there was a small brethren assembly of less than 20 people. 
and those believers didn't know of any other believers on the island. So the evangelical work in Malta in this era is really quite young. I mean, there have been believers there in the past. I've read some old uh, periodicals from the 1800s of someone who was in Malta and writing the churches in England, telling them about the need. So there's been people there over history, but in the era in which we live, the movement is very, very young. And the Catholicism being so dominant, uh, there wasn't anyone allowed to build a church building without the consent of the Archbishop of the island. And as the country moved along in its history, uh, there were some people who were pushing some of the aspects of freedom that had ever been pushed before. And uh, God put Joe and Jenny in the favor of a lawyer who was really concerned about freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and so on. And, and he helped guide them through the process of seeing an amendment made to the national constitution uh, which allowed our church to have its very own building. So uh, Joe had to prove that Baptists were a world religion, and he had to kind of write a short history of Baptists to prove to the government that we are uh, not just some weird cult, uh, although a lot of people still think that, but uh, to, to prove that we're a genuine worldwide thing. And, and through that, God allowed us to have the building we have. So it's a, it's a very unique thing. There are some other churches there now, evangelical churches, but uh, none of them have their own standalone building like we have. And uh, to my knowledge, this was not a blanket decision, but others still have to apply the same way our church did, and I don't think anyone else ever, ever has. Uh, this is just it from another angle. We're at the end of a dead-end street, and you can see we're tied right in close to our neighbors. And... Uh, this is some of our building project to make our building more accessible for the disabled and have a little bit of parking area and so on. So we've knocked down some stairs that were in the front of the building and we still have left the ramp you can see on the far side, which is how we get up now for our services. But that ramp will come down too and that will be a parking area for about eight cars. And I know Pastor Bart shared some of this when he came back here. You might think eight cars... You know, you look outside the windows here and you see this wide open space. Uh, there's hardly any space like that anywhere in Malta for parking. And where we are on Sunday as people come to church, many have to park, you know, far away and, and walk 10 minutes to get there. Many, in fact, don't even bring their car to church. Uh, we have a, a minibus company that we hire to help bring people to church and many people just ride the minibus even though they have a car, because there's nowhere to park once you get there. So this is going to help a little bit, at least for those who need to park close because of disabilities, they'll be able to. Uh, and then uh, on the other side, again, you can just see everything stone uh, there. On the other side of the building was where this is. There's going to be a new walkway that goes uh, onto another street at the other end of the property. And that will allow people to park in a public parking lot that's not far from there and easily walk into the property from the other side. So we're going to solve a, an access issue to the property uh, as well as the ability within the building to get up and down to the different levels by installing an elevator and so on. And so there's been a lot of construction to make that happen. Uh, the elevator is right at the end of the hall where Charlie's plastering the wall as he plasters walls uh, every day of his life, I think. He's, he's there every day, one of our men. And uh, the builders build a wall, and he plasters it that afternoon is kind of how it works. And uh, just, a faithful, just a faithful man. Now, this is the upstairs of our building where we will meet once we're finished. And there's a balcony in the back for overflow, and the elevator will go to the balcony as well as the main level and then two levels down below that. Uh, right now, this is where we have our kids' classes and the teen class, and there's ping-pong tables and things there. Uh, it gets very, very hot this time of the year, so we'll need to install air conditioners and those things uh, for that. Uh, just back up. Uh, but where we meet is down below. So in the video where you saw the people singing is directly below that room, which is almost the same size, but it's a bit smaller. Uh, the ceilings aren't as high. There's some pillars in the way. And we're full most Sundays uh, down there. So it'll be great to have uh, extra room upstairs. Uh, here's 
what our ministry schedule looks like uh, throughout the week, which just gives you a sense of, of what it's like. Normally, Joe and I alternate all the preaching. So I'll preach one Sunday, he preaches the next. You know, I do a Thursday, he does the next. I do a Wednesday and go, he does the next. So we're always preaching twice a week, but never back to back is how we've worked it out. Uh, now, they go back to the States for three months every year now, now that we're there, uh, which means that we're doing all of these things for the three months when they're away, and it, it is a very busy season of ministry. We just have one main worship service on Sunday. It's a, a longer one, and it's just a, a, a joy to go through the morning together, and it's just high energy. There's, uh, on average, a dozen people there every Sunday who've never been there before, so there's just these new people. Some of them are tourists, some of them aren't. And so you're always trying to find out who people are and meet them, and uh, just from all over the world. And it's just a joy to uh, open God's Word and to preach and to be connecting with people that you'll be seeing later in the week. So that's our Sunday service. It's a, a busy time together, and uh, we just love our people. Uh, they love to sing, and they, they love to hear the Word preached, and they're taking pictures of PowerPoints and uh, taking notes and, um, you know, people, just with so many people from around the world and a lot of new believers, you'll sing a song that you've known all your life, but this is the first time that they've heard it and they're asking, you know, where can I find that song? And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's just an interesting day on Sundays and uh, they're tiring, but we love our Sundays. Now, Tuesdays, we have a volunteer morning in the morning, which is kind of an office day. It's a day when people can, if they're available, come and do odd jobs around the building. And then Tuesday evening, we have our Faith Bible Institute for three hours, which is a, a DVD program done by a pastor in the southern U.S., and it's a, it's a good program. It's a three-year chronological study through the whole Bible. And so the students all get a notebook. They have uh, the thick Wilmington's Guide to the Bible and many of our people who've come to Christ have jumped right into this program, and it's been uh, their first time through the Bible, kind of guided by a teacher, and it's been a very helpful uh, tool. So Joe and Jenny have been running this now for a number of years, and uh, some of the ones who have gone through it have had relatives that have come and visited them and attended and uh, gone and started it in their own church in Austria or other places uh, because of how they've been impacted uh, with it by our church. So that's, uh, the new semester will be at the end of August, it'll start, so that'll be going when we get back. And then uh, Wednesdays, we travel over to Gozo for the Bible study there. Now, from our house to Gozo to the Bible study it takes about an hour and a half by the time you drive, get to the very cross and get there. So I typically leave about 3.30 on uh, Wednesday afternoon and then get home around 10 o'clock that night and uh, we have that study there. We have a number of our families that used to live in Malta that moved to Gozo and so they are the core of our group there. They come over to our services Sundays uh, but we, we meet over there on Wednesdays and that is uh, going to be a new church we trust at some point but we're doing all we can right now and it really is going to take someone really living over there and investing in the communities in Gozo uh, for that to take its next steps and to begin meeting on Sundays and so on. So we feel like we're kind of maxed at what we can do there for now and we, we're going to maintain that, but we need, we need some more people for that to be able to go beyond what it is. But there's never been a sustained evangelical ministry there, 30,000 people or so in Gozo, and so there's a real, a real need for a church to be there. So that's Wednesday nights. So then we come back to a volunteer morning on Thursday morning at the main church, and then our midweek is Thursday evening uh, there, and it's not uncommon to have first-time visitors most Thursday evenings as well. And then uh, Fridays, once a month, we have a young adults Bible study, and we would really like to do that more often than once a month, but uh, we're just we are who we are, and we feel like we're maxed out with what we can do. Uh, you notice in this schedule, there's no youth group. And that's really another need, is to have someone 
is we're starting to get some teams now. We just had a bowling activity before we came back, but that was our first one in two years. And again, you look at that and say, where would you fit a youth activity into the schedule and who would do it? So there's, there's always more that could be done, uh, but we're, we're doing about as much as we can do right now. But we do those Friday evenings once a month, and then Saturday, every Saturday morning we have cleaning in the morning, and then we have that outreach time. And that's kind of a flex time a little bit. If we have people that are going to be baptized, we'll have some baptism meetings on Saturday mornings. Uh, but it's a, it's a full schedule. And uh, just to show you some photos again of, of the people, this is where we meet right now in the downstairs. And a lot of times uh, out in the foyer area, we have to set chairs out and we have a TV screen for people to watch out there. And uh, as people see the numbers, it's a little bit deceiving because of all of those people, we only have about 30 who are members. And we always have a segment of the church that's there for a while and then gone. We have a lot of students and we have people who come and work for a while. Uh, we have people who come and, and fall away. Uh, it's just a, a very unique place. I posted in one of our prayer letters about, uh, uh, about an article someone wrote about ministry in the city and in university towns. And they described it as hugging the parade. Because it's people who are just on the move through and you have a period of time to invest in their lives, but then they're gone again. And that's very much what it's like where we are. There's just people coming and going every week, and uh, you try to uh, help them while you can, but then they're, then they're gone again. So a lot of people look at a picture like this and say, why do they need a missionary pastor? It looks like Fundamental Baptist Church. It's a full congregation, uh, but the numbers are, are deceiving. It's, it's not a stable group as far as the amount of people. There's always lots, but not the same. And a lot of our people are very young in the faith. Uh, we don't have any deacons. And we are a little ways off from that. So we have a lot of people to work with, but there's a lot of development to be done. And that's really uh, what needs to happen right now to see this church kind of stabilized and then be able to focus on the Gozo Church plant and uh, beyond from there. We do have a kids' ministry during our morning service. Erica and a lady from the Philippines are the uh, heads of that, and they alternate months, and they have others that help them. And uh, once in a while, usually Christmas, they'll have a song that they sing. And uh, we have a lot of kids. Uh, after the service... We usually are kind of tearing down and setting up for the next thing because this room is used for a lot of things. So there's always stacking Bibles and getting the, uh, the offering envelopes and setting it up differently for the Bible Institute. And then after Bible Institute, we set it up for Thursday night. And then after Thursday, we set up for Sunday. So when we have that upstairs, it'll be really nice to kind of leave things as they are and be able to use the downstairs for the other things. And uh, we... Naya here is helping with some offering envelopes, I think. They got captured along the way. Uh, usually every Sunday after the service, one of our men, Alex, will be there uh, getting that Sunday sermon that's just been preached, uploaded onto the internet, and DVDs burned off, uh, because a lot of people take the uh, DVDs and CDs of the services and uh, pass it on, or people who have missed uh, catch up with services that they've missed. This is the foyer area, and you can see the DVD rack there. We keep gospel literature in our track rack from uh, many, many different languages because we have so many people from so many places coming. Now, we just had uh, a tract called May I Ask You a Question that uh, one of our young men translated in the Maltese, and we're having that printed this summer to add to our arsenal of gospel literature, and uh, we're going to have that translated into Turkish as well. But we try to keep Bibles in a whole bunch of languages available to give people. Uh, we had a Turkish student there the other night who was uh, lear there learning English. And I was talking to him right here in this area and was able just to reach my hand back and grab a Turkish Bible off the shelf and hand it to him and say, here, you can have this. And he was surprised that with that ease, we were able to give him <laughs> the word of God in his language. And we just try to have those things on hand because uh, like every... Every week, we have those opportunities. Uh, we try to get people together. 
Uh, again, when people are coming from so many ethnicities and cultures, they don't naturally connect with each other. Uh, we do have that bond in Christ, and we see that, uh, but it takes work to have that body life together that we see uh, in the New Testament. Uh, there was that Jew-Gentile friction that was such a, a contentious thing in the first century. And while we, I wouldn't say we have contention at all in our church, uh, it takes work to try to get people together um, just because people are different. Uh, a lot of the ones who've come from Catholic backgrounds are used to walking in the building, doing your religious thing, and then walking back out because that's what they've done their whole life. And to teach them that the church is the family of God and we, we live life together and we help one another. And so we try to foster that through our fellowship times and game nights and uh, encourage people like the, this man is in Malta working, his family's still back in Africa and he's working, sending money back and hoping to be able to bring them. We have a number of people in our church that are uh, sending money back to relatives and they found good work in Malta. So we have a lot of uh, lonely people, a lot of people with specific needs because they're a long ways away from uh, their wives uh, or children even. We have people who have young children like far away on the other side of the world but they're working in Malta to send money back. So it's just lives that are so very different than most of us have ever thought of or would think of as normal are, are normal to them. So we try to learn about that and to serve them. The university is just a mile away from our church and so we do have people coming to study that are uh, at our church as students and some, a lot of them are master's level or even higher so they're around for a while, some of them are there shorter. But a lot of them are language students that are there for six weeks or three months and uh, are believers and they come. A lot of them invite friends and so uh, weekly we'll have people from Brazil and Colombia and uh, Korea uh, who've never been in a church before but their Christian friend at language school invited them and they've come. And uh, so we just have people like that all the time. And so through our young adults activities we try to connect with them and uh, teach God's word and leave that impact on them before they go. Uh, a lot of them come on a Thursday evening before the midweek service to play ping pong for half an hour before the service starts. And so that's been a, a great way to connect people together. Uh, it's always a joy when you see people coming to Christ and uh, wanting to obey the Lord in baptism. And we've had a number of baptisms in the last two years since we've been there. A couple of them have been our own children. Uh, Selah was baptized just a few weeks ago before we came back. And I uh, baptized Kian uh, the year before. And we've had a lot of others baptized as well. And uh, it's just, it's a special time. It's always a special time. But in, in that Catholic culture, that is such a statement to be able to tell people that you're following Christ and you're following Christ this way. And uh, this, those are truly special times when we have those uh, baptism times. And uh, they're all special. One, one particularly sweet one was when this older Maltese couple here on the front of this picture uh, was baptized. They had come to Christ uh, just last year. Their, their children had come to Christ the year before and they were resistant. But uh, finally, the Lord broke that down, and they were saved. And uh, Joe just went to be with the Lord earlier this year, and he just had uh, peace in palliative care while he was there, knowing where he was going. Uh, but the year before, he didn't have that peace. Uh, but he, he did, and that was, it was sweet to be able to have them uh, baptized. In fact, we were having our baptism meetings on Saturday mornings, and... Uh, he came with his wife. His wife had decided, I'm going to be baptized. And so we were having meetings together and hearing their testimonies. And that particular time, I did like you do here, where I had them write out their testimony, and then they, they read it while I recorded it. And then we played the recording at the church before they were baptized. That's the first time we've done that. And it doesn't always work to do that, but we, we did. And as we were uh, meeting, uh, Joe had, hadn't committed to be baptized yet. He was still fearful of what his relatives would think. Uh, he already had cancer. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was a believer. But when you're 
uh, Catholic and you're that age and you know you're going to die, uh, all you've ever known is a Catholic funeral and you're wondering, well, what, what kind of funeral if I'm, am I gonna have if I'm not Catholic? And so he just had all those things that do I want to publicly identify through baptism as a Christian at this point? Well, as we were uh, having the meeting, uh, they get up and, and we had talked about what to wear and uh, they were on their way out to the car and he turned to his wife and uh, said, what, what color pants should I wear? And uh, he hadn't indicated till that point that he was going to be baptized. And uh, she kind of looked at him like, you're going to be baptized too? And so it was with joy that we had them as part of one of our, our baptism services. And then we had his funeral a number of months later. Over in Gozo, we have a, a hotel who's willing to rent their hotel conference room to us on Wednesday nights. And that, this is where we meet. And uh, it, it works to be a great facility. It's right in the center of the main town, and it's easy to get to. And that's where we have our, our weekly services there. Uh, we're glad for the team that God is putting together. Uh, we have an, a new couple who will be joining us, Luke and Anna Tanis. Uh, we just skip ahead to their photo, and their little boy, Theo, he's almost uh, two in a little while, and they've just begun raising support. They're at about 20% right now, and we can't wait for them to join us because they're going to be able to help us push into some of those uh, things that are just on the edge right now and we can't get to them. And so we're praying that the Lord will speed them along as they come to join us, they're a great young couple, and we were able to spend some time with them in Cleveland just a couple of weeks ago. And so be praying for Luke and Anna uh, as they come to join us, that the Lord will help them see uh, exactly where uh, they'll plug in to the plan of things. Uh, Joe and Jenny, as I mentioned, they come back to the States now, to the Detroit area, and visit supporting churches every fall. So we'll only be back a month, and then they'll leave till January. And we always love to see them come back. And so this is them coming back last year and the big welcome back banner that our kids made for them. And uh, so they'll be away again. And as, they, as we continue on, we know that they'll be getting closer to retirement. And uh, they're really glad. They've been praying for people to come behind and to help us. And once we get that help, they'll feel more freedom uh, to take additional steps in their lives. Uh, but for now, we have a team of the three couples, and we're really looking forward to that. But we could use more. And as you look at the map here, uh, you can see the, let's turn this way, they're kind of all the same color on this map, but uh, this is where our, our main church is right here. So we're right in the heart of the most populated area of Malta right here. And uh, then there's the Gozo Church Plant, uh, we live just very close to the church, and Joe and Jenny live uh, out here, about half an hour drive away. Uh, but right now, we have this ministry going and this one underway, but there's a lot of work to be done in those two ministries. Uh, but if we can see those developed by God's grace and established and, and leaders trained up within those ministries, and, and that's happening very slowly, but it's happening, uh, then we would like to see additional churches planted in the, the south of the island, which is uh, more, more Maltese, uh, and then in the north of the island would be the next kind of two population centers where there is really room for another church to be planted. And so pray with us for the ministry on these islands that the Lord would send us more laborers. There's, there's a lot more room for work uh, than we can do, even with three couples. And we're trusting that the Lord will uh, advance the cause of the gospel in these ways. And we really thank you for the part that you have uh, in it. It's a very real part. When you pray for us, that those prayers, they hit the ground in Malta. They hit the throne of grace first. And then uh, the answers hit the ground where we are. And, and we can only do it knowing that you're praying for us. Uh, because... As I mentioned, the, the natural barriers to the gospel are so hard, and yet God is at work. Uh, we very much know our limits, but through God's help, he pushes us beyond those limits, uh, both physically in the demanding schedule and 
just in wisdom to handle situations that we've never even thought of before. And we, we need you praying for us, and we know that you are, and we thank you. Uh, we need your encouragement, because sometimes we feel like we aren't seeing progress. And uh, while the, uh, it doesn't seem like we're that far away in some respects because of FaceTime and so on, every time we do hear from someone, uh, it does mean a lot. Um, we send a prayer letter out. Usually we'll have a handful of people that just send one sentence back, and uh, that's a precious sentence. We, we love hearing back from people. So we thank you for that. And then the finances to be able to keep us there uh, as well. Uh, we really thank you for that. Um, the Lord is supplying for us. Our support's a little uh, on the low side now, but we just had a church last Sunday vote to take us on for support in Pennsylvania. So we're praising the Lord. And we know as we look at the scheme of things, what God is doing, where he's placed us, uh, we know that he wants us there and we know he's going to supply for us to be there. So we praise him for that and for everything that is, uh, that's going on. I'll just finish our thoughts this morning before we sing again with what Jesus said in Matthew 28. Uh, as I was mulling over it this morning, there's, there's a, a word in that passage in Matthew 28 to 20 that is perhaps one of the uh, most neglected words of the Great Commission. And that's the word, therefore, where Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And when you just go to the previous verse, Jesus has said, All uh, power, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And that is just in a phrase what the whole book of Matthew is about because Matthew has presented Jesus as the king who fulfills all of the Old Testament promises. And so when you look at that word therefore that Jesus uses, go ye therefore, he's pointing really back to the whole Old Testament and all of the promises of who the Messiah would be, what the Messiah would do, and Matthew connects Jesus of Nazareth to all of those promises saying, this is he, and then he gets to the very end and he has Jesus in that conversation and records his words where he says, because of all of this, because of who I am, because of what's been said about me and what's going to happen because I'm the Messiah, go and teach all nations, baptizing them, teaching them, and I'm going to be with you. And as we think about the task, wherever we are in the world, it's a global task because it's Jesus' task. And Jesus is the king. He's the Lord of the universe. And as we look at those promises, we understand the uh, concentric circles out of Jerusalem, but we know it's a worldwide dominion. And we know in this age, he's calling people of all nations and that gives us the confidence to be able to go, knowing this isn't just something we've come up with. This isn't just something that we do to get churches together. Uh, but this is, this is what Jesus is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. And we can therefore go in confidence, uh, knowing that he's with us. But he calls us all to be together in us, and we're so thankful for the fellowship that we uh, have together. Why don't we pray, and then uh, Pastor Keith will come. Our Lord, we thank you that... You are at work on the island of Malta. It's just a, a blip on the map that most people don't even know about, but you do. And we're constantly amazed by how you're at work in people's lives, even apart from us. They come to us with you having been at work in their lives for a long time without us even knowing, which shows us that you know where it is, you have a plan, and you're building your church there. And we thank you that you've allowed us as churches in Atlantic Canada to be part of what you're doing in the Mediterranean. We thank you for the privilege our family has to be living there and serving and seeing it firsthand. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, the concern that people have for us and for the ministry. Lord, for the Christ-centered love and the, the fellowship and the gospel that we enjoy. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, even today, as Joe has already preached, that your word will be at work in people's hearts as they have heard it. Just as we pray that that will be true from what's been said today and what's 
will be said these evenings of Vacation Bible School this week. Lord, we pray to see the harvest of the planted seed. And we thank you that this is your work and we can just serve in it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you'll want to uh, take a moment to, to have a chat with uh, Josh and Erica and their kids on the way out. And so I'm going to, as we have our last uh, closing song uh, together and what's been just a fantastic uh, Lord's Day, I'm going to ask uh, Josh and Erica and the family if you don't mind just dismissing yourselves to the back so folks can uh, get to you and uh, have a word. And uh, again, just what a joy to be reminded today of a great cause of the gospel and the harvest that is there. In John chapter 4, uh, Jesus talked to his disciples about the harvest after ministering to the Samaritan woman. And uh, the song that we learned here a couple of years ago that just reminds us of the harvest, that once we receive uh, Christ's gift of salvation, then we have this commission to then go out and share that with others. And so we're going to sing that song, just the first and last verse. Uh, the song, uh, verse 1, just really uh, speaks to the invitation to those who are lonely of heart, uh, to the outsiders, to come and to find mercy at the cross, but then verse 4 says, then go to the outcast, uh, people like the Samaritan woman and others, people in Malta, people in your neighborhood, people in your workplaces, and go and carry that message of salvation with you. So let's go ahead and stand, and we'll sing verse 1 and 4 as the burls are dismissed, and then we'll finish our service here. Adamson, would you mind dismissing our service in prayer, please?